morning out there in YouTube and internet land. This is Andrea from Cairo and Oak Ridge and it is my pleasure and honor today to teach on one of my favorite books of the New Testament and possibly the Bible altogether. The little epistle of Philemon which is one of the Pauline epistles meaning it was written by Paul the Apostle. Um, I just want to jump right in. It's very small. It's 25 verses. I want to read it start to finish, and then after that, we'll go through and unpack it. This is a little book. While you're grabbing your Bibles and turning there, um, it's between Titus and Hebrews. So if you will turn and go to Titus and stop after Titus, you'll be at Philemon. But if you keep going after Titus and you find yourself in Hebrews, you want to go back a few pages. Um, it's a little teeny tiny book. Um, it's, I would say, probably one of the lesser known of Paul's epistles. It's not one of, when you hear and see preachers and pastors and Bible expositors preach on the epistles of Paul, Philemon is usually not at the top of that list. Usually they'll go for Romans or they'll go for 1st and 2nd Corinthians or for 1st and 2nd Thessalonians. But there's a lot in Philemon. Philemon is a little book that packs a really big punch. So if you have your Bibles and you're ready, I'm going to go ahead and start reading. I'm reading from the New King James Version. Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our beloved friend and fellow laborer, laborer, to the beloved Appia, Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in your house. Grace to you and peace from, our, from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God, making mention of you always in my prayers, hearing of your love and faith which you have toward the Lord Jesus and toward all the saints, that the sharing of your faith may become effective by the acknowledgement of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. For we have great joy and consolation in your love, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed by you, brother. Therefore, though I might be very bold in Christ to command you what is fitting, yet, for love's sake, I rather appeal to you, being such a one as Paul, the aged and now also a prisoner of Jesus Christ, I appeal to you for my son Onesimus, whom I have begotten while in my chains, who once was unprofitable to you, but now is profitable to you and to me. I am sending him back. You therefore receive him, that is my own heart, whom I wish to keep with me, that on your behalf he might minister to me in my chains for the gospel. But without your consent I wanted to do nothing, that your good deed might not be by compulsion as it were, but voluntary. For perhaps he departed for a while for this purpose, that you might receive him forever, no longer as a slave, but more than a slave, a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. If then you count me as a partner, receive him as you would me. But if he has wronged you or owes anything, put that on my account. I, Paul, am writing with my own hand. I will repay, not to mention to you that you owe me even more your own self besides. Yes, brother, let me have joy from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in the Lord. Having confidence in your obedience, I write to you, knowing that you will do even more than I say. But meanwhile, also prepare a guest room for me, for I trust that through your prayers I shall be granted to you. Epiphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ, Jesus greets you, as do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, Luke, and my fellow laborers. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. Wow. 25 little verses. You might call that, I mean, that could be a text message or an email in this day and time. Not much. Probably, I mean, 
not even probably a whole scroll, maybe not even half of that, just a little, maybe just a little torn piece or a little, just a little corner of a scroll. But there's so much that's being said here that is just fascinating and absolutely delights me. That's why it's probably one of my favorites. It's, it's probably my favorite epistle because... In this epistle, we get to see Paul in a different way. We don't see Paul the Apostle. We get to see a little glimpse of Paul the man, Paul the Christian. And I just, I think that's awesome. Because this is a man who's very guarded, who lets us see glimpses of himself in, his, in the other epistles, but not like he does in this one. And there is, among scholars, a question about how to classify Philemon. Is it an epistle? Is it a letter? And this is a book that was gifted to me by my uncle. It's called Wilmington's Guide to the Bible. And the man who wrote it, Dr. Wilmington, was a Bible professor at Liberty University for many years. And he was like an encyclopedia of knowledge. And... This is his guide, and he gives an answer to this, and this just oh, delights me because he quotes Dr. J. Vernon McGee. And so I'm going to read this with delight. Dr. J. Vernon McGee writes, The epistles present a different style in Revelation. God has used law, history, poetry, prophecy, and the Gospels heretofore. But in the epistles, he adopted a more personal and direct method. In this intimate way, he looks back to the cross and talks about the church. Someone has said that the epistles are the love letters of Christ to us. I love that. Dr. Dysman divided them into two classifications, epistles and letters. The epistles are general, while the letters are more personal and individual. Under this division, the epistle of Philemon would be classified as a letter, for it is individual and intimate. There is reason to believe that Paul did not expect its contents to be divulged. At other times, he knew that he, was writing in, that he was writing scripture. This does not detract from the inspiration and value of Philemon, but rather enhances its value and message. So it's typically included under the heading of the epistles, because everything Paul wrote is called an epistle, but it's a letter. It truly is a letter. And we have Paul tell us in there, let's see, where's the verse where he says it? In verse 19, he says, I, Paul, am writing with my own hand. Now, we know from a lot of the other epistles that Paul would dictate. He would, he would, he would speak it, and then someone else would write, perhaps because he had very bad eyesight. But in this, if we take him at his word, which I think we can take Paul at his word, he wrote this himself. So this was something that came directly from his heart to Philemon. It doesn't get more intimate or more personal than that. And I love how Dr. McGee, in, through the, in, his, in the five-year Bible study, talks about how he feels whenever he reads Philemon like he's reading Paul's personal mail. He said, I feel like I'm snooping and I'm reading in his mail, and maybe I shouldn't be doing that because it's so personal. I don't know. I think Paul, I don't know, I don't claim to know as much as the, about the Bible as Dr. McGee did. Certainly not. But... I don't know. I think Paul, I think the Spirit of the Lord prepared Paul that anything he wrote was going to be public, could be public knowledge. I mean, he wrote to Philemon and he says in the early verses, in verse 2, to the beloved Athia, Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in your house. So Philemon, we know from, from church history, he was a citizen of a city called Colossae, which Colossae was, I'd say, about 75 to 100 miles, maybe more, inland from Ephesus in Asia Minor. And so the little church of Colossae, the Colossian church, Colossians, which was written to the, that church, 
um, met in Philemon's house. I don't think it's too unreasonable to think for Paul to have thought that perhaps when he sent this letter to Philemon, he understood that maybe Philemon would read it, Philemon would read it to his wife, his son, and would probably share it with the church too. So I think there was an expectation that it would be personal. Also, Paul gets personal in this letter, but it's not like he lets his hair down and he bears his soul. He doesn't do that. He's still guarded. He's still Paul the Apostle. He's very, I don't know, when I think of Paul the Apostle, I think of John Wayne a little bit because he he was more than just a man, and it's like he was he was the Apostle. I mean, apart from Peter... In early church history at that time I mean those were the two those were the two guys and I mean Paul was just indestructible it didn't matter what you did to him what you threw at him what situation you put him in he came through it like a champ you know he was beaten and left for dead outside of Iconium and he was truly dead I don't believe he was half dead I believe he was dead and then after he was left the spirit of God raised him from the dead and he came back to life. He survived the shipwreck on Malta and was carrying wood and was bitten by a viper, which is a deadly snake, poisonous, and just shook it off with no ill effects. I mean, that's such a, to me, that's such a John Wayne move. That's a John Wayne thing to do. Just to sort of walk and be like, eh, get off me. I'm going to keep on doing what I'm doing for the Lord. I mean, this man was so much, was, we get to see the man and not just the apostle. So let's start to unpack some of this. Um, I want to start. The name of Philemon is, very, is a very interesting name. It means, it can mean love, it can mean affection, it can even mean kiss. And the name of Philemon is connected to a legend in Phrygia, which Phrygia, where Ephesus and Colossae and Laodicea and Herapolis were, was Anatolia, but above that was Phrygia, and there was a legend in Phrygia of a man named Philemon and his wife Bossus that was recorded in Ovid, the Latin writer. In this legend, the gods, Zeus and Hermes, the king of the gods, Zeus, and Hermes, the messenger god, come to earth disguised as travelers, and they go into Phrygia, and they ask for shelter, and they ask for food. And everywhere they go, they are repeatedly rebuffed. They're treated with derision and hostility. They journey on, and they find this little lowly hut that is inhabited by this little old married couple, Bossus and Philemon, who graciously welcome into their home and share their wine and their bread and what little food they have, which isn't much. According to the legend, I think it's kind of funny, they have a goose and as a pet, that they keep as a pet, but the old man Philemon is trying to chase the goose to kill it so that he can cook it and offer it to the guests as a meal, but the goose keeps getting away from him and then slyly runs in to where the guests are being entertained and jumps into the lap of Zeus. And the, the life of that little goose is spared because it jumps into the god's lap. I, th I think that's funny. Um, when the gods make their presence known to this little old couple, they are at first scared because these gods have come to visit them and they've offered and what they they feel that what they've offered is so inadequate and they start immediately pleading for their lives because they're afraid that they're going to take their lives because what they've offered is so inadequate and the gods are very gracious to them they tell them they're going to lead them to safety and then they're going to flood the the whole area because of the wickedness and the cruelty of everybody else so they're going to spare them. After that, a great temple is going to be built for them. And 
Bossus and Philemon have two requests. They request that they be the caretakers of the temple, and they also request that when one of them dies, they can both die together. So that way they don't ever have to be parted and they don't have to be separated. So legend has it that they are the caretakers of this temple and that when they die, the gods transform them into these trees that are intertwined forever. And that's how they stay. It's possible that Philemon was named for that legend. And the name Philemon, I think, is, I think that could say a lot about the man. We've talked a lot about that at Kairos, about how the meanings of names have significance. This was a kind, I believe this was a kind man. I believe he was a decent man. Even before he was saved, I think he was a good person, kind person. Tried to treat people the way he wanted to be treated. And then we have in the let me get out of this. Then in the introductions, he introduces Philemon as his beloved friend and fellow laborer, and then he talks about the beloved Athia. Most people believe that is Philemon's wife. The name Athia means fruitful or productive. I think that's a good name for her as a woman. She as his wife, she would have definitely been a fruitful wife. Not necessarily in childbearing, but maybe in other things she helped with. And then the next name, Archippus, means master of the horse, and most scholars believe that was his son. That was their son. And it says in the um, word that he is our fellow soldier, so that means that maybe he is a preacher or has a leadership role in the Colossian church. It is in their house. So we see this family. And it's, it says a lot about them that Paul would take the time to write a personal letter that he himself penned to this man. But the reason he did that is on behalf of one named Onesimus, a slave that used to be in Philemon's household. And that brings up another interesting aspect of this of this little letter because slavery is sort of in the shadows and in the background of this. It's interesting. Um, Dr. McGee also said that during the Civil War, Northern abolitionists believed that Philemon was they they read it and understood it that it was a strong condemnation against slavery. And but the Southerners, who obviously had slaves, especially the slaveholding Southerners, believed that it was a very firm conviction that slave that slavery was right, that maybe slavery was just. I don't know that it's really either one of those. I think slavery is just part of it because he does say that Onesimus was a slave. The understanding is, is that Onesimus was a slave, probably in his household, probably very likely a tutor for his son, because a lot of prominent Romans would have slaves who could read and write Greek and Latin and knew the classics and could teach their children. So it's most likely that Onesimus was a, was a slave in the household, and for some reason, he stole from Onesimus and ran away and made his way to Rome. Now, there's a lot of, um, the reactions to Onesimus run the gamut. There are those who want to talk about what a, what a scoundrel he was and how wrong he was and that he was a thief and maybe he was a thief all along and he was trying to embezzle lots of money from Philemon. I don't know that I get that. I think Onesimus was a young man who was a slave, and I think he wanted to be free. I think maybe he just, it wasn't that he didn't appreciate the kindness of, a, of Philemon, because a slave's life under in the Roman Empire was not a good life at all. Most slaves were treated very harshly, very cruelly, um, over half of the population of the Roman Empire was enslaved. And if a slave 
was caught stealing or running away, I mean, the, the punishment could be you're branded on your forehead with CF, which basically means beware the thief, or it could be, you could be, they could be crucified. Um, Augustus Caesar, the first emperor of Rome, had a slave crucified who accidentally killed one of his beloved pigeons and a quail because it was a mistake. I mean, that's, that's the level that we're talking about with slavery. I don't believe Philemon was like that. I think Philemon was, like I said, I believe he was a good man. I want to believe that because Paul has nothing but good things to say to him. Paul is very kind to him, and I think, I don't think it's that Paul is buttering him up. I think it's the fact that Paul knows him. Um, the, most scholars, most Bible scholars say that it's doubtful that Paul ever went to Colossae. Most likely, the church at Colossae was an outgrowth of, of Ephesus because Paul went to Ephesus on his third missionary journey and was there for two years. And it's possible that Philemon, who's obviously wealthy enough to have slaves, would have had financial dealings in Ephesus, so it's possible he that's how he and Paul met and how he came to a saving knowledge of Christ was in Ephesus. And out of that, you have the outgrowth of the church at Colossae. You also have the church of Laodicea, because Laodicea is very close in proximity to Colossae, just within a few miles of where it is. So, I think Paul got to know Philemon pretty well. And I think when he speaks to this man, I think it's genuine, I think it's from the heart, I think it's true. What I find fascinating is starting in verse 8, he tells him, he's in, but Paul is also very frank. He's very loving. He tells him that he prays for him. Can you imagine being personally listed on Paul the Apostle's prayer list? That's pretty cool. To know that it says, I thank God in verse 4, I thank God making mention of you always in my prayers. Hearing of your love and faith which you have toward the Lord Jesus and toward all the saints. Let's, for just a minute, let's turn back. Let's go back to the book of Colossians. Give me just a second. I'll tell you where. Give me just a second. Colossians 4, verses 7 and 9. Let's go there. Okay, this is also... In the New King James, Tychicus, a beloved brother, faithful minister, and fellow servant in the Lord, will tell you all the news about me. I am sending him to you for this very purpose, that he may know your circumstances and comfort your hearts. With Onesimus, a faithful and beloved brother who is one of you, they will make known to you all, all things which are happening here. It's widely believed that Tychicus was probably the pastor or the leader of one of the leaders of the church at Colossae. And he was also a friend. He was a, he was a fellow laborer and a co-worker of Paul's. And so Tychicus would have known Philemon. Philemon would have known him. And then it mentions Onesimus, the slave. And it talks about how he is a faithful and beloved brother who is one of you. That means he's one of he's one of them. He's one of he's one of he's one of the church. It says a lot about Onesimus. He doesn't he doesn't describe Onesimus as a slave. He doesn't talk about his past. He just says he is a faithful and beloved brother. I think that says a lot about the change that Jesus Christ made in the life of Onesimus. I think it also says a lot about the character of Paul, about what a good-hearted, tender-hearted man he was. What a change from the angry, seething Pharisee we see at the beginning in Acts before his conversion, who is just... He is consumed with hatred and bitterness 
and he is going to destroy the church. <clears throat> Excuse the expression, but I can't think of anything else to say. And we are he's just, come hell or high water. He's going to do it. And now, when he's changed, when he's and we also believe that Philemon was written during his first, his initial imprisonment, his first imprisonment in Rome, which means it was house arrest. Which means he wasn't in the dank, dark dungeon yet, chained to the walls. He was he was on house arrest. He still had some mobility. He still had some freedom. I'm just when I think about the change in him from all those years ago to where he is, this chained apostle who wears physical chains, but his mind isn't chained, his spirit isn't chained, his heart isn't chained. He is in his mind he is free to do what he what what God has called him to do. That's what he's there for. And you see the affection and the love that he has for all of these young men in his life. Timothy, Titus, Onesimus, others. I mean, he mentions by name John Mark. He mentions Demas. I think it's interesting he mentions John Mark because John Mark left that first initial missionary journey when Saul, when, when Paul and Barnabas set out. He left. He went back home. He went back to his mom. And yet by this time... He's redeemed himself. He's made good. He's restored into fellowship. And there was such a rift because the second journey, Barnabas wanted to take wanted to take Mark with him. And Paul was adamant he didn't want him to go. And so it caused a split between Paul and Barnabas, and Paul ended up taking Silas. And yet, John Mark's been restored to him. That says a lot about him. That says a lot about his character. That says a lot about his feeling as a man in his heart. That shows me that he's not just a great writer who can write beautiful Greek and make and, and, and think such high and lofty intelligent theological thoughts. He he is the real deal. It's not that he it's not just that he knows how to write it. It's not that he just knows how to say it. He lives it. He lives it. This is who Paul is. This man of love. Moving on. I could stay there and we could never go anywhere else. I just think that's amazing. Um and then in verse 10, he says, I appeal to you for my son Onesimus. He calls him as a son whom I have begotten while in my chains, meaning he led him to the Lord while he was in chains in Rome, who was once unprofitable to you, but now is profitable to you and to me. Now, I think when Philemon was standing there reading this letter, I'd say that probably caused him to chuckle a little bit because the name Onesimus means profitable or useful. So what Paul is doing here is Paul is punning on his name. He's saying this Onesimus who is called profitable once wasn't profitable. But now he is profitable to both you and to me. I think, I think Philemon might have gotten a little chuckle out of that. And then he says, I'm sending, you, I'm sending him back. sending him back. That says a lot about Philemon. That says a lot about his character. Because once a slave had run away and was returned back to their master, they could do whatever they wanted with him. They wanted to crucify them, they could do that. They wanted to beat him within an inch of their life, they could do that too. They could do, under Roman law, a master could do whatever he wanted to with his slave. So, Paul, we, we might think, well, isn't Paul taking a chance? I don't think so, because I think he knows Philemon's heart, and I think he knows that Philemon is not going to do any of those things to Onesimus. He knows that. Listen to how he talks to him. Do you really think? I don't, I don't think 
that Paul would have said to Philemon, our beloved friend and fellow laborer. I don't think he would have taken the time to speak those words of kindness if there wasn't some basis in truth to that. Because Paul was a very loving man, but Paul was a very practical, pragmatic, very had his had both feet on the ground, eyes looking always forward. He was very frank too. And I don't think he would have spoken that kindly to Philemon if there wasn't justification for him to do that. I don't think he was buttering him up. I've heard I heard some people, I listened to several sermons over the last few weeks, and some people kind of laugh and like to say uh, Paul was probably buttering him up. I, 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 I reject that. I don't think he was. Because then in verse 8 he says, Therefore, though I might be very bold in Christ to command you what is fitting. That means if Paul wanted to, he could use the full weight of his apostolic authority to command him. Because Paul was an apostle. Um, Paul was one of the apostles. He wasn't just a an apostle. He was one of the apostles. Um, his name and his and his character and his his authority had a wide he had he had a wide reach with that. And if he wanted to, he could have commanded it. And. He knew that if he did that, Philemon would have probably would have probably acquiesced. Because Philemon owed Paul a lot. Paul was the one who brought him to a sal to a saving knowledge of Christ. Paul was a friend. Paul was somebody that encouraged him. It's very possible that Philemon was in business and he was successful before he was converted, but after his conversion, who knows, maybe he became even more successful because of God's blessing on his life and because of having that benefit of having Paul as as his mentor. It's possible that Paul could have issued a very stern, very rigid command and Philemon would have probably obeyed it, probably begrudgingly. But Paul says, yet for love's sake, I rather appeal to you, being such a one as Paul the aged and now also a prisoner of Jesus Christ. So this is where we really kind of see Paul getting real. Paul is saying, I am, I, I do have this authority, but I'm older. And I'm a prisoner for Jesus. And I think maybe... He's saying that to help soften, he's maybe saying that to help soften Philemon's heart a little bit. If there's any bitterness in Philemon's heart towards Onesimus. Because how could Philemon be too put out with Paul? After all, Paul has suffered a lot. He's old, he's getting older, he's probably around 60 at this time. 